morning, everyone. Welcome on this late summer Sunday. I was hoping for some sunshine today. Um, maybe we'll get some later on, but I know we've definitely had enough rain where we are. So um, thank you all for being here. We're grateful that you're here and joining with us today. Special welcome to all of our visitors, uh, anyone who is over in the fellowship hall, and then everyone who will be joining us later online today. When I saw the title of Ed's message, Nearing the Peak, um, immediately my mind went to the mountains and how much I, I love the mountains and how much Ed and I enjoy being with them. You know, we spend a lot of time in the Adirondacks. They're beautiful. We've got a very slow start on climbing the 46 peaks. Um, at the pace we are, we'll be about 100 by the time we get all 46 of them in. But we like being out and hiking in them, and we've had the privilege of being in the mountains in some really beautiful places around the world. Being out in them and hiking um, always makes me feel a little more up close and personal, gives me an opportunity to see things from a little bit different perspective, and really enjoy um, and appreciate the power and the magnificence of God. As much as I enjoy hiking, um, I have to admit there are some times that I'm not always having fun when I'm out there. Uh, there's rocks, there's mud, there's bugs, and sometimes a lot of just plain hard work. But when you get to the peak, when you get to the top and get a chance to look around, um, you're just in awe of the view that you see. I love to find a spot, sit down, look around, and really just look at the awesome work and the beauty that God has created. And I'm struck again and again each time that the God that created all of that is still at work in the world today, and he's at work in each of us. In Psalms 95, it reads, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods, and in his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for your presence today. Thank you for the beauty that you've created and entrusted to our care. Help us to value, appreciate, and care for all that you have made for us. We ask now that you please be with us as we worship together and that you open our hearts and minds to the message that you have for each one of us. Thank you again for your presence, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'm going to ask Shirley to come forward um, and lead the music. Good morning. We will be singing from the dark blue hymnal today. And our first hymn is 582, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, and I invite you to stand if you are able.
21. Turn to 521, please. Someone in the back is laughing very hard this morning. <laughs> I have a few things um, that I'd like to share, some highlights from the bulletin. Um, Sunday school will, re will resume on September 10th. We have a few more weeks at this early um, summer hours. Worship, then, worship time will then go back to 10.30, to a 10.30 start. There are a couple of adult Sunday school options. Peter Keyes offers an adult Sunday school class, and Susie Rice offers one in the fellowship hall. So we welcome all of you to come join us for Sunday School. And also, Ed will be offering a four-week Bible study that will be um, starting in September. If that's something you're interested in doing, I believe it's on um, books of 1st, first, first, 2nd, and 3rd John. So if you're interested, if, if you find that idea intriguing, um, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall starting in September. Also, we have some prayer requests. Um, a couple of things here. Sue uh, Bush shared with me. She said, Jeff Bush would like to thank everyone for all the prayers and cards. He wants to note that prior to his surgery, he told Ed that Ed didn't need to come visit him in the hospital, but Ed came anyway. And later in the conversation, Jeff, Ed called Jeff stubborn. Um, <laughs> Sue adds a little note, though, that Jeff wins hands down on the stubborn piece. So thank you. We're glad to hear that Jeff's doing better. Um, we also have a prayer request. Uh, Kenny Widrick's mother, Lila, um, is in Albany Medical, and um, she, she recently had a fall, and they put in a temporary pacemaker, thought it might, was heart-related, and a permanent, a more permanent um, pacemaker will be, will be put in. We also want to lift Angie Robbins and her family um, the loss of their mother, Ronnie, this week. It's been a difficult few weeks for them, so we wanted to uh, lift them up in prayer. Arrangements are with Sunquist Funeral Home later in the week. Um, Sean Rogie, and we'd like to pray for Sean Rogie and Christy following Sean's fall from a, from a roof where he injured his shoulder. They're trying to figure out all of the things, um, the outcomes there. 
And we also want to ask you to continue to lift up um, Sandra and Larry Leindecker. Sandra will be having her surgery uh, this week on Wednesday in Rochester. Um, and we know there will be a pretty lengthy um, recuperation and recovery from that. So we ask your prayers. Let's um, bow our head at this time and lift all of these. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your presence among us. We thank you for the work that you're doing in each of our hearts, in each of our lives. And we know, Lord, that you are the ultimate healer. We're lifting to you many things, Lord, that we ask for your healing. We ask for your comfort in each of these situations. We ask specifically right now, Lord, that you be with Lila as she goes through um, her recovery here and any procedures that she has coming up. We ask that you be with the family and all of the doctors and nurses that are giving her care, Lord. We ask too that you be with Sean and Christy Rogi as Sean is recovering from this fall and they're trying to determine all of the um, things that are at work there and we ask that you bring healing to him. We ask too that you be especially close to um, Sandra and Larry this week, Sam and their family. Uh, Sandra has her surgery. Lord, we know this is very delicate and difficult work and we know again, Lord, that you have plans and that we pray for a full recovery here, Lord, and we ask again that you be with doctors and all of those who will be providing her care. And as Angie and her family are, are grieving this week, Lord, at the loss of a loved one, we ask that you comfort them and bring them peace and bring them good memories that help carry them through these difficult times. Lord, we know there are many people that are grieving in our community and within our church family and in the greater community. And we ask that you bring comfort and peace to each of them. Help us to be your hands and feet to everyone around us. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to ask Araya Grau to come forward um, and do our scripture reading. Today I am reading Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee, from Jordan, to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as God, Jesus was baptized, he went up to, out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Thank you, Araya. This time we'll ask the ushers to come forward to lift the morning offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
we come before you again today and we thank you um, for the opportunity to give back to you just a small part of all the, all the blessings you have given us. Lord, we ask that you bless the gifts that we give today, that we use them for furthering the work that you have for us to do. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to do this. We ask now that you bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss any of the children that are here today to go out for Children's Church. I think Pandora's going to go too. have special music led by Charlie and friends and that'll be followed by Ed's message. here at the Bull and I see we have a little correction. It says music by Charlie Foster is music by Charlie and his angels. <laughs> behind this song. It was very interesting. I shared it with Ray a few minutes ago. Uh, the author is Horatio Stafford. The song was written back in 1873. Anybody go back that far? <laughs> um, Horatio was a, was a successful businessman. He grew up in the Chicago, Illinois area. He uh, became very wealthy. He became an attorney. Uh, I, I don't know if he dealt with real estate, but he acquired a lot of real estate in the Chicago area. Uh, he married the woman of his life, and he had three daughters and a son, from what I read. And uh, at the age of four, his son passed away from scarlet fever. Apparently that was common back then. And shortly after that, there was a major fire in Chicago called the Chicago Fire. If you've heard of that, I, I really didn't hear about that before. But he lost a lot of his real estate at that time. And he needed a break after all that. Decided to take his family to Europe for a vacation. And he sent his wife on a ship with her three daughters, with the three daughters. And he stayed back because he had some business that he had to take care of. And he was going to meet her probably in England, somewhere in Europe it was. And in route to Europe, his wife and the three kids, there was an accident collided with another boat, they sank to the bottom. Uh, 200 people died in that accident, and his three daughters passed away, drowned in, in that. Uh, as soon as his wife was able, she sent a telegram back to Horatio, ex explaining the crisis, what happened. And of course, immediately he took the next ship out to go to be with her in England. And the captain called him up and said to him, this is the area where the ship went down. And at that point, he sat down and he wrote this song, It Is Well With My Soul. So he was a very faithful man. He was a Christian. He taught Sunday school. He was very active in his church. But tragedies happen to all of us, no matter what our situation. And I, I think the, the, good, the good news is that Christ says he will always be with us through these difficult times. And some of us that have had more than others share that here in this congregation. Uh, he'll be he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us and the, and the big promise is that he'll come back and take us to be with him someday so that's the background i thought it was a very interesting story i wanted to share that so, so. if you'd like to follow along it's number 321 in the light blue hymnal yes
a welcome to everyone here and who may be listening to this later online. I do have to follow up a bit about what Cheryl said, my comments to Jeff. I don't believe I said I was stubborn. I believe what I said is I don't always listen. But <laughs> either way, maybe it's true on both accounts. Well, here we are, August 20th, just around the corner. Kids and school staff and everybody are going to be getting pretty excited about what's coming and school sports are going to be beginning here in the next few days. So we know what it means. Things are going to be changing, and it's kind of a, an enthusiastic, exciting time for so many people, and I think it's important for us to recognize that. Well, I don't usually start my message with a joke, but this morning I decided to. That's usually Romy and Ray's department to try to get us laughing a little bit, but our neighbor shared this joke with me uh, because it was a preacher joke, and so I thought I would share it this morning. It goes like this. A preacher woke up one Sunday morning. And it was a beautiful day outside, and he decided to skip church. He wanted to go play some golf. So he called his assistant pastor and said he wasn't feeling very good, he was sick, and asked if the assistant pastor would bring the sermon that day. 
And the assistant pastor said, don't worry about it, I'll do it for you. So the pastor drove 40 miles away from church so he wouldn't be seen. And as he got up to the first hole, Jesus leaned over to God and asked him, are you going to let him get away with this? Jesus said, Jesus, don't worry about it. I got this covered. I'll handle it. And just as God said that to Jesus, the pastor got up to the tee. He hit a 450-foot shot. The golf ball landed on the green, and wouldn't you know it, plop, it goes right into the hole, hole in one. The pastor was ecstatic about what would happen. Well, Jesus asked him, why would you let him do that? God told Jesus, who's he going to tell? <laughs> well, you don't have to worry about that with me. I don't golf. Um, and I don't fish, so the fishing stories wouldn't be too big. But I do go hunting, and I'll tell you when I'm gone, October 5th through the 15th. And so, um, so it's okay if I get something now. Just one of those funny little stories. And I think we probably would all agree we kind of get caught up in those kind of things sometimes and want to cover our tracks. And that poor pastor hit the drive of a lifetime and never to be able to share it with anybody, I'm sure. Maybe years later. Well, that had absolutely nothing to do with the message today, but I thought it was kind of funny to share. Nearing the peak. I should have put in parentheses, too, that that doesn't mean that it's over. Nearing the peak doesn't necessarily mean that it's over. You know, there are so many high points in our life. We all experience our high points. And I think it's important for us to understand that it takes energy to reach those high points in life, and Cheryl shared a bit about that as well. Now, those high points may be something different for each of us. Maybe it's educationally. You know, fifth graders or, or kindergartners when they're five years old, they celebrate when they get their diploma and graduate kindergarten, that's a pretty big deal. That's a high point. That's a, that's a high peak for five-year-olds. High school seniors graduate from high school and they get that diploma. That's an even bigger accomplishment. And then college graduation and beyond. Well, those are some peaks educationally that people will try to climb and get to the top of. Well, possibly your peak is professionally or vocationally or in your job, wanting to reach a certain level professionally or in your position of employment and you have this thing that you are ascending to the heights of whatever those possibilities may be. Pretty important to have those goals and try to climb to the top, I'm sure. Or it may be, as Cheryl said, a literal mountain that you want to climb. And yes, we do enjoy doing that. You know, the perception on nearing the peak is dependent on who we are. My perception of the peak might be different than your perception of the peak because your life experiences are going to be different than mine. I know for Cheryl and I, when we were hiking up and we're almost to the top of a peak, we talk, we talk about it and say, we're almost there. And then sometimes you get there and say, oh, we're not quite there. Have to go up another little level. But when we get there, we're looking forward to a little bit of a break and taking a rest and maybe getting a drink, maybe getting a little snack. But we also know that nearing that peak and getting to that peak doesn't mean it's over because then you have to go back down. And what we have found is sometimes going back down is as challenging or more challenging than going up. But again, it's the perception. You know, when I read or reach the top of any kind of peak, what do I say? Do I say, this peak is awesome. Here's my diploma, I throw my cap in the air and I've reached it and all those kind of good things are gonna come my way. Or I receive that position of employment that I've always wanted I'm going to earn the most money that I could ever earn in my career, and the life is just going to be great, and I'm just going to coast through the rest of my career working. That's one way to look at things. Or do I look at the experience as being a brilliant experience and take in the view, as Cheryl was saying, and then also think about this being the launch to what is next? Do I absorb all the brilliance of what I've attained whatever that may be in my life, and then think of it as the next chance to go forward. You know, what is next? What is coming next? Where is it going to take me? Ironically, I was talking to Travis Call. Um, he and his son Carson are out in Utah right now, and I, no doubt, I know right now, they're a couple hours behind us. They are on top of a mountain somewhere, and you know, with their bows in hand. And I was talking to them because they're going to be backpacking on this hunt that they were going on. 
and I was asking what they were going to be using for some of the food. There's all kinds of backpacking food. And this was really interesting. He said, well, one of the things that we're going to be using is called peak refuel. And I said, Travis, that's awesome because I'm going to be doing a message on nearing the peak. And that goes right along with that, what my thought is. Peak refuel. Basically, getting there and then refueling for what is coming next, whether it's a downward track or whatever it may be in life. Peak refuel. Two weeks ago at Beaver Camp, we celebrated with three individuals baptism. Next Sunday, we're gonna celebrate with two more people up front here with baptism. And that is no doubt a high peak in a Christian life, to be able to share and express and let others know about what we believe and what we've accepted and all those kind of things that go along with it and that celebration. But I have to question myself, is baptism the Christian peak? Does that mean that that's as high as it can be? Does that mean that from then on and everything, nothing will ever measure to that? Is that as good as it gets as being a Christian? And we know that's not true. It's this launching of acceptance and then letting others know. You know, jo Jesus showed that this is a new beginning. Thank you, Araya, for reading. I was a little bit worried when Cheryl started looking through my Bible that everything was going to fall out, because sometimes it happens. But if we go to what Araya read in chapter 3 of Matthew, and Jesus himself is being baptized. John didn't think he was worthy of baptizing Jesus, but Je Jesus said, this needs to be done. This is important that this is done. And he says this, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The Spirit of the Father, his Father, descended on him. That's pretty spectacular. Can you imagine? Now, I've been involved now as pastor in my own baptism and viewing other baptisms. I've never seen the heavens open like that. I do remember a few years ago, Jim Devers was a little worried because we were getting in the water at Beaver Camp, and I didn't see it because behind me, a lightning bolt flashed down at the end of the lake. I think that's as close as I've seen the heavens open on a, on a Sunday baptism. But in Jesus' situation, the heavens open. I would see that as being a spiritual high peak moment for Jesus. And Jesus could have said, I'm here. I've attained it all. I'm spiritually endowed now with my father's help i have everything i'm enlightened you have seen it come to me anybody that needs me come to me jesus could have done that he was jesus he could have stood in that peak and said here i am i've done it all i'm ready to be um, able to share what i know with you but figuratively jesus came down from that moment figuratively he left that high peak of his baptism to come to the people, to meet the people where they were. And it was also a significant time right then because that was the beginning of his ministry. The beginning time of when he was going to be promoting all of what he was just experiencing. And so it wasn't the ending, it wasn't the end of all end, it wasn't the highest peak for Jesus. It was the beginning of something and was very noted. You know, many times I've observed sports teams, and as you know, I was a coach for many, many years and that kind of thing. I've absorbed, uh, observed athletes and sports teams reach the pinnacle of performance, either winning a championship and carrying a banner around or winning a medal, whatever it may be. Those are pretty glorious times for teams and individuals if they're athletes. And I've seen some then say, I've done it all. I'm done. That's as far as I can get, I can't go any farther. But I've also observed groups of athletes and teams and individuals who are involved with that choose to do more. I've reached this and now I'm going on to do more. You wouldn't have repeat champions if you didn't have individuals that said, there's more to do. I've attained this, but I know I can do even better. I know I can do even more. What's the new mountain? What's the new challenge? I'm ready to conquer what's next in front of me. Sometimes just attaining that can give you that extra boost and, 
help you with your attitude and going forward to do what you needed to do. Jesus demonstrated this. He experienced a high point of baptism when the Spirit of God, his Father, descended on him. He experienced that. But then for the next three years, as I mentioned, he went out. He walked with other people. And everything he was doing from that point was to start climbing to his next peak. From that moment of baptism, his work was climbing for the next challenge and working along the way. Everything he taught, everything he said, everybody he taught and touched, and the compassion that they experienced because of him was leading him forward to his next event, his next high point. If you want to go to John chapter 19, we'll look at this. And I'm going to be bouncing back and forth a little bit. Jesus was moving on to his next high peak, which was his sacrifice for us, which we know as being the cross. John chapter 19, verses 28 and 30. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and looked at Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus got to that high point, that sacrificial high point we know as the cross, and he bowed his head, saying, it is finished. Now, some people might read that and say, it's done. But no, Jesus had made a promise along the way that that wasn't going to be the end. And we know it wasn't the end. And now I'm going to go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. It wasn't the end, and we know it wasn't the end because he said something else was going to happen. Matthew 28. After the Sabbath at the dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb where Jesus had been buried. He was taken from the cross, put into a tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know what you are looking for, for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. So Jesus was taken off that high peak of the cross, put down into a tomb, but he came up and rose up from that, going to another high peak. And the angel of the Lord said, yeah, he's not here. He's alive, just as he said he was going to be. Another high peak, another high point moment. Now, jump ahead to Acts. I told you, we're jumping around here a little bit. All the same story. So Jesus hit the high peak of the cross, came off the cross. And then he went to the tomb, kind of a low place, but he crawled up out of that. He conquered the tomb, he conquered death, and he rose again. And in Acts chapter 1, it says this, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proof that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, he was eating with them. He gave them his, this command. He said, don't leave here. Don't leave Jerusalem. My spirit... God's Spirit is going to come on you, and it's going to be so momentous. You've got to be here for that. But he went on to say this. It is not for you to know the time or the date the Father is set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So he was crucified, he conquered death, that was kind of another high peak, and then he came back with the people, came back with the people and made different appearances with the, his friends and everybody, talking to him about what was going on, and he had promised he was going to rise again, that was accomplished, so he was really telling them, I have told you all these things, high peak, low point, high peak, low point, brilliance, and then he ascends in front of their very eyes. I would say that's a pretty tremendous, spectacular, high peak moment for those individuals who saw that. Jesus going up in the heavens. But, even as 
he was preparing to go, he was leaving them instructions. He said, this isn't it. This isn't the end. This is a, another high peak moment, but it's not over. He said, I want you to go from here. I want you to take this message that I've given you these last three weeks, or three years, go out, tell other people. Tell other people about what I've done. Let them know about the sacrifice I've given, the love that I've shared, the forgiveness, all those things. Tell other people. And he also, and I'm, I'm kind of um, adding a bit here, but I think he probably would have said, don't get caught up in all this stuff. Yeah, this is phenomenal that I'm going out in front of you and all this. Don't get caught up in this moment. Recognize I've come to teach and share a new way. Build on that new way. Climb in that new way. Let others know about grace and peace and hope and love. Everywhere you go, take that out. The Holy Spirit's going to be you, be with you. This is a new start for you. Climb higher. Take it with you every step of the way. Now, I want to just pause, just a little side note here. Retirement. Cheryl and I talk a little bit more about that. Maybe it's our age. I guess it is our age. And I know many of you are there or are getting closer to there. And when I was a kid, I remember people talking about retirement. Well, I think that it has changed a bit, what retirement is today in 2023 versus what it would have been 50 years ago. Because as a kid, I used to think of retirement as being the time when people would go to this retirement villa and just basically sit back in a rocking chair and watch the rest of life go by. That's what I used to think of retirement as being. But thankfully, I have seen, especially in recent years, that's not the case. That retirement, I see people saying, wait a minute, there's more to do. There is so much more to do in this life than just watch it go by. Last week, Peter and Loretta shared about their experiences with Mennonite Disaster Service. And they've been doing it since 16, 2016, taking their RV, going and traveling all over the United States and helping and, and going out and doing more after retirement. I am so grateful that now retirement means I can shift and thrive. I can shift and thrive in a brand new way. I can look at things in new ways. I can do things I may have never done. What is possible for me now that I maybe wouldn't have had the time or energy to do in the past? I am so grateful for individuals like Alton Berkler, who's 90 year, was 90 a couple years ago, still out on his bike. How about that? That's thriving in retirement. Or how about Llewellyn's there? Llewellyn's back here, 94 years old. He just transitioned to Meadowbrook, and I know he's making connections there, still coming to church. That's thriving. That's thriving in retirement, shifting. What's next? There's more for me to do, more, for, more ways for me to serve. You see, nearing the peak doesn't mean it's almost over. Doesn't mean it's almost done. Nearing the peak signifies I've climbed this life moment, whatever that life moment may be. And maybe climbing this life moment is to get me in shape and refuel me for what the next task, the next experience that God may have for me, the next peak that God has for me to climb. Because there's always another day and there's always another challenge. Surely. Once again, take your navy blue hymnal and please turn to hymn 599. We will be singing verses 1 and 3 of He Leadeth Me, and I invite you to stand.
another prayer request I just ask you to remember Willie Moyer and their family and the last of Willie's wife, Marilyn, and calling hours are today, with the funeral to follow tomorrow, and just be in prayer for them as a family as they experience loss as well. Next Sunday, next Sunday is another Sunday of celebration and baptism, Hannah and Tara Leindecker, and the message title will be Wash, Rinse, Repeat. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus, who demonstrated the importance of climbing peaks and launching into what the next challenge may be. Help us to recognize that in every step that we take, you are there with us. Your Holy Spirit gives us the strength to go up and to come down and to go up again. Help us always to be prepared to share your love, share your grace, and share your mercy. Amen. Go now, peace. Go.